I have another thing. I, have, I think you guys have come to know who I am pretty well over the last few weeks. I, so I'm not trying to ever try to be hyper spiritual, but I feel like uh, one of the few times in my uh, few times in my life I've had another uh, like a vision, a mind's eye vision. Uh, and I'll just tell you what it is. Uh, first of all, um, Sh- Shira, Shira th- that was a masterful, masterful series of songs you put together. Absolutely masterful. Beautiful, beautiful. And, uh, and the theme was just the solid rock. When the waves come in, I've got the rock. He is my firm foundation. I will not be moved. I will trust in him. And that is where this, this imaginary little vision-y thing I, I want to share with you comes from. And whether that's just you know, part of the leftover from the 1960s when I smoked dope, or whether that was uh, something that was from God or just something active right now, I, I, I will just tell you what I see. I see that rock she was talking about, that firm foundation. I see standing on it and the waves are crashing. But I see on top of that rock five or six or seven pieces of, of, um, uh, what's the kind of wood that's kind of pressed together? Fiber, uh, not the plywood, but the one with the smaller ones. Particle, Particle board, thank you. One, one of those pieces of particle board is something that we've, we stood on on top of the rock. That's called the United States government. Uh, leadership. Another one is our educational system, particle board on top of the rock. Another one on top of the rock would be our banking system. Another one on top of the rock would be any number of things that maybe the educational, whatever, whatever, that we have recognized that we stand on them because we trust in their consistency. We trust in their value. We trust in, in uh, what they have to offer our lives. But as the waves crash in, those are all eroded. That particle board is eaten up And there's only one thing under your feet now, and that is the solid rock Jesus Christ. And this has been a discouraging time, a a, a difficult time trying to figure out what can I trust in, what can I trust in. I I know to never place 100% of my trust in any one thing, but I've never realized what it's like to place no trust in anything. And I don't know what it's going to look like, but my particle boards are all eroded away and the crashing waves are bashing against the rock, and I stand solid tonight, today. Solid rock today, you guys. Are you catching the theme? And it's not a matter today as there will be no winds or there will be no floods or there will be no, no other events. It's a matter of saying there is only one you place your trust and hope in. I've always said that statement, but it has never meant more to me than it has in these recent days. I will make a confession of faith. I absolutely, totally, completely, and irrevocably place 100% of my trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, the solid rock on whom I stand. Amen. Now, today, uh, let me pray, and then then I'll make my confessions. Um, Lord, uh, I pray that the heart of God will be communicated today, and uh, that we will hear what we're supposed to hear from these many scriptures. Um, And I pray that the end of it will be an action or something that we can do to please you and to change this world. In Jesus' name. I am not giving up on the United States of America. I love her. And I, boy, you've got to understand when I say that, I mean it. I love the United States. I've served for eight years in the military, as have many in here, and far more than that. Uh, and I, I will say this before you as a witness. If they call and ask for old men like me to sign up again, I will do it. I will defend our country. And I will, I will gladly go to my grave defending this country. I love America. It's not going to sound like it. Because I'm going to critique us today a little bit. As you can see from the scriptures I handed out to you, I thought way better than just trying to run back and forth in various slides. I'm just going to read, and I bold, emboldened the, the, the verse numbers so you can see them easy and catch them easy. I'm talking today about 20 years after 9-11. Yesterday was, was the celebration, if that's the right word to use. I hope you watched Sean Foyt uh, in the na- nation's capital. Nobody, nobody reserved the 9-11 and 12 time slot on the, on, the, on, the, on the National Mall in all of America on this 20-year anniversary. Nobody reserved it. And Sean Foyt 
reserved it yesterday. We saw about a two or three hour uh, live session with him, anointed of God. And today, starting at three o'clock our time, there will be a four hour time uh, with thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people gathered on the National Mall with unabashedly and unashamed singing to the Lord Jesus Christ and encouraging one another and praying. I believe still, I believe still in America and I believe in the possibility of healing. I read the Old Testament, you guys, and, and I see that horrible things rise. Horrible kings get to the, get to the uh, throne. Horrible, wicked men and women. The, and, and the whole nation falls under, their, under their, their leadership or lack thereof. And unfortunately... Some people are born and live and die without knowing the next king that's going to come that raises the nation back up and brings it to repentance and br brings it forward and under the blessings of God. The cycles, the cycles of history uh, seem to indicate that when you come to the bottom, that's what the book of Judges is all about. Uh, it, it, I think it's seven cycles. The Midian, the Israel got careless. The Midianites came in. Israel called out. God judged the Midianites. Israel got careless. You know, the Amalekites came in. God judged the Amalekites. They call out to God. They repent. And there's these seven cycles to show that there are cycles in history. And I'm trusting God for one more cycle. I know there will be a day when things are completely worn out, completely gone, irredeemably gone. And I believe that somewhere near that time, the church will be one of the other things gone. And there's a lot of debate as to when all that will be. And we can talk about that on Wednesday night sometime. I use Wednesday night to talk about anything like that that, that, we can, that the church wants to know about. I'm trusting God for a new cycle. It's always on the calling out of the people of God, the crying out of the people of God, the repentance of the people of God that determines that cycle. It's never the fiber board. That's gone now. So if my people who are called by my name... Uh, will humble themselves, which indicates fasting, by the way, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. And when that happens, you'll probably see him reveal a wicked way in you. Maybe you don't know about it right now. But in a time of prayer and fasting and seeking his face, there's a good chance that he's going to say, here's what I want you to deal with. And, and will repent of their wicked ways. I'll heal. I'll hear from heaven. I'll heal their land. It can't be any clearer. Say that again, I'll heal, heal their land. We're, we're a wounded land today. And the, the scary thing is this. Now, I'm going to get really negative about America, but you've heard my preface, right? I love America, but I'm not at all proud of what she's doing today. And the problem with it is this. You and I aren't the ones making the decision, unless you voted that creep in. <laughs> you and I aren't the ones making that decision. Someone else is making those decisions for us. That's scary. Because if I go to another church or another gathering and I present this very same thing, no one in that gathering, very few people would be against what we're saying. We don't like it, but we're not being able to make change. And the sad thing is, after 20 years, this is the 20-year commemoration, after 20 years... America is in much worse shape than it was on 9-11. I never thought uh, that would be happening. That concerns us. And that is today's topic. Now, this, is, this may be piecemeal today. This is, you're probably not going to hear me yelling all over the place like I normally do because this is going to be more like a teaching. <laughs> and by the way, uh, uh, Rick. Rick? Ron's brother Rick, right? Rick? Ray, Ray, there you are. I did not yell Wednesday night. No, no, I went back and I watched that whole thing. <laughs> there, there, huh? <laughs> I was so proud we got through the night and I said, hey, I, I have to be somewhat loud because there's no, there's no uh, uh, microphone in there. So that's what you heard was just that. that is a justification. <laughs> I love you, brother. The today's topic is what I just described. Why are we, 
Why are we in worse shape after 20 years than we were 20 years ago? Immediately. Now, there's a thermometer we're going to look at. There's a group of people around which I'm going to create this, this sermon, this teaching today. The thermometer. And that group of people I want to look at 20 years ago and I want to look at them again today. They are the non-believers. Okay? They are the, the um, humanists. They are the secularists. They are the non-Christians, or whatever other term, New Agers, whatever you want to call them. That's the group I want to look at. Not, we're not looking at the church a whole lot in here. I want to look at them, because here's what happened 20 years ago. Those people ran to God. 20 years ago, when the Twin Towers collapsed and these other traumas took place, our churches across America swelled with people who are secularists, humanists, even anti-God people, because somehow... Oh, that was a yell. Somehow, they knew in their hearts, whether they love him or not, or know him or not, by the thousands, by the millions, they ran to church the following week because they felt somehow God would be involved in the solution to what was happening in America. Our church swelled, churches across the nation swelled, and that was pretty thrilling, but the problem is it was very, very short-lived. It lasted in some places three weeks. A couple of people got saved, I'm sure, during it because the preachers really pre preached repentance. And that's the other thing that happened on the previous 9-11, on the original 9-11, is not only did the secularists run to God, but the church ran to God. We, I was there, I was one of them, I was a preaching, and, and I watched my church, and every, it wasn't just that new people were coming in, it was that we felt a resurgence of, of responsibility. What part did we play in this without rubbing our nose and stuff? The Holy Spirit was telling us, You're, there's, a, there's a lethargy, there's a lukewarmness, there's something going on that is allowing this in the country, because if my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves, I judge things by the church, and, and the church heard the message. And we preached it to ourselves, and we preached it uh, to the globalists and the other secularists and humanists and do-it-yourselfers. We preached it to them, and they left. They left. But I think it's a pretty good depiction of what took place, that very few exceptions, the non-Christians and secularists and the humanists and the New Agers and do-it-yourselfers, those are the ones that we're supposed to watch here. They turned to God, at least to the church. And, um, and then it lasted for only a few days. Now, here's the kicker. Let me say it one more time. Today, 20 years later, we are clearly in worse shape than we were on September 11th. And I'm not saying people are not turning to God. Because right now, let me say this. The church is turning to God in the greatest manner I have ever seen her turn to God ever in my life. Except for maybe during the Jesus movement. There's such a turning to God right now in the churches of America that it's being referred to as the second Jesus movement. This is not like 20 years ago. This is a turning to God that is getting national attention, that gets long-haired hippie type Sean Fouts to go to 135 cities in the darkest places of the world and say, we're claiming the dark places. Something new is happening. Yes, there are maybe a relatively few that are representing it, but I want you to see me here. I don't know what my role will be outside of here right now, but I represent that. I represent that revival. I represent that deeper commitment to the Lord. I represent that going back to my first love. I, I represent the man that needs to confess and say, I've become a lethargic and dull and my axe isn't sharp and I repent and I stand in front of you not as a, a consummated man, but as someone that says, I'm getting on board. I'm yelling. <laughs> I'm getting on board. I'm getting on board. Are you wanting to get on board whatever it's going to look like? It doesn't look pre-COVID. It doesn't look like what it was a year ago in this church or any church. And if we try to rebuild that and reestablish that, we're going to fail on this one. Something new is happening. A new thing. If you want me to define what it looks like, I can't do it because I'm swimming in those waters, but the current is taking me somewhere. 
and it's happening across this United States of America, there is a huge move back to God by Christians. Amen. However, and here's the kicker again, this time, 20 years later, there is absolutely no move to God or the church by the secularists and the humanists and the do-it-yourself religionists. There's the big difference. There, that's the thermometer I'm telling you about. That's the thing to watch. Not only are they not showing, or not one, not one. <laughs> They're not showing up. They don't give a rip. In fact, they're now telling us we're going to close down your churches and we're going to refuse to allow you to sing in public. There's been a change in what has happened in their hearts and in their lives. And it's a massive, massive change. Why and how and what took place? So I've handed you this, and Lord... Only the Lord knows how far we're going to get through this and how much sense it will all make. But so far, I think the introduction has been pretty good. <laughs> um, these scriptures are probably the clearest example of what's taken place in our society in the last 20 years. Now these cover way more than 20 years. But there's an acceleration. Once people start turning their back on God, and once people start deafening their ears on God, and once people start suppressing the truth of God, there's a point where it accelerates. And haven't you found yourself saying in these last few weeks or months, things are going so fast. I found myself saying we're no longer going down a slippery slope, we're falling off the cliff. I can, can't see. How did we get here? How could we ever move this fast? How can this be so blatant? How come there's such senselessness and stupidity among some people that are so arrogant? How can it, this affect Walmart and Starbucks? How Hospitals. You don't get the shot. You're getting fired. What, what kind of insanity? I'm not against the shot or pro the shot. The point is I'm against somebody telling me that's not my doctor what I'm going to inject in my body. And if I choose to do it, then I'll do it. But if I choose not to, you can't tell me. What kind of insanity? How did we get here? What kind of bizarro, freaky world are we living in? We can't recognize. And I know I'm getting negative, but it's true. Let me, do, let me get it off my chest because some of you would like to push me aside and preach yourself right now. Because this is so important for us to hear. This scripture explains. It's not the only scripture, but the entire content of these verses explain exactly what's going on. How far I can get through it, I don't know, but here's what I'm going to do. I'm, you guys are so, I'm going to put aside Wednesday night's First Peter study. We've done a whole series of one week. And I'm going to explain this in perfection this coming Wednesday. Now, just a little advertisement. We had a whole bunch of people here. I didn't know if the COVID scares, if there would be, but the room was pretty, almost filled up, and all kinds of people online, and I appreciate, uh, I appreciate Paul and Shira. They make, they, everything's really current. We're hearing stuff from the people that are online. If you can't be there, we're listening to their questions and, and whatnot, so I encourage you Wednesday night, give God another hour of your, give God another hour this week, okay? Uh, my heart and my passion is that as a, I am a preacher and a teacher, and I will not waste your time. I promise this Wednesday we're going to cover what I'm not getting done here today, and, uh, and I'll let you know what it is. Okay, moving on. My wife's giving me the move on signal. You guys, if you want, if you want fun, sit, sit around front where these people are on the side, because then you can watch Kathy's signals to me. I'll, I'll teach you what they are. Get your hands out of your pocket. That's one, right, Kath? Uh, the other one is, just you wait till you get home. Uh, <laughs> the other one is, move it on, move it on. Uh, it, it's, oh, this one is, shut up and sit down. <laughs> so, so, um, I've handed you to this whole page of scriptures, and I'm going to reference them back and forth today. 
Um, in order to answer from these scriptures, in order to answer from these scriptures uh, what is happening in America, I need to introduce a concept that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to deal with for the next couple of minutes. God is a God of revelation. Now, that's got to be understood here because that, that explains the background of what's going on in these scriptures when, when we get to reading them here. He is a God of revelation. That means this. You cannot find God by your own searching. Now, I know the scripture says, those who seek me will find me if they seek me with all their heart. I understand that, but that's only because God is responding to your seeking him. He is a God of revelation. You can, you can climb a mountain and you cannot find God there. You can cross the desert and you cannot find God there. You can't find God. Because he's a God of revelation. And he only reveals himself. And if he doesn't, you will never see him. You can cross the seven seas. You can plumb the depths of the waters. And you cannot find God. However, Moses climbed a mountain. What did he find up there? God. God will always respond to your hunger and your obedience. It's, it's always your move. You want to see more of him? Lean into what he's showing you. You want to see less of him? Don't lean in. And what these scriptures are showing you is the danger of what takes place in the society when the people refuse to lean in to the smallest and most subtle revelation of God about himself. Did, did you catch that statement? Just the most subtle ones, because some of them are very subtle. But I don't care if you're an aborigine. And God gives a slight revelation of who he is, and we'll describe how that's done in a minute, and especially Wednesday night. If he gives the, the, a subtle revelation and you lean into it, God will give that aborigine another piece of revelation of who he is. And if he leans into that, God will give another. And God's intention is to bring that person to a place where when Jesus is preached to them, they will accept Christ as Savior. He's a God of revelation. Paul was in the desert. He found Christ. And he found three years of teaching in the Arabic letter. Elijah, the Arabian desert. Elijah had the wee small voice of God. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. What extent God will go through to reveal himself because he is a God a God of revelation. And people by the billions throughout the ages can speak today, including those in this room, of their intimate walk and relationship with Almighty God through Jesus Christ. Why? Because at some level, at some point, God spoke to your heart something, and you leaned into it. And he spoke something else. And that's why sometimes it takes some people a long time to get saved, because it's a slow process of leaning into God. Leaning into God, leaning into God. Sometimes, like Paul on the road to Damascus, you get his struck to the ground and explosions around you, and you think, I think I'll accept that God. He's a God of revelation. So, these scriptures are talking about a specific revelation. I'm going to ask you a question in, in, in just a couple of moments. And I really want to see the, the response by a raise of hands. This is talking about a specific form of revelation that's called general revelation. There's another revelation called special revelation. This is general revelation, and I'll explain what it means, especially on Wednesday night. But how many in here have a pretty good handle on what it means, what general revelation means? Can I get an idea? Real high, because I want this helps me to determine where I'm going. Okay. Okay, that's, that's really good. You're a well-taught church. So, general revelation is what can be known about God well, the theology, the theology books say through three sources. I'm just going to use one. Uh, through history, through conscience, and through creation. And so you're supposed to learn by history. And most people don't do that. And a conscience, that gets pretty weird and defiled. Ah, but nature. Nature. So the one I'm going to pick up on now, and I'm going to show a multitude of scriptures come this Wednesday night, is what can be known about God with, through nature? That's general revelation. Because even though it's not talking about Jesus, it's giving you an opportunity to lean in to what you're seeing about God to the next step, to the next step, to the next step, to the next step until you find the special one, Jesus Christ. So the Bible tells us the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. 
Now we're talking about our society. Since what may, here it is, what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, some versions say from the creation of the world, in other words, the, 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 the creative things are the source. So since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power, His divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so men are without excuse. So we're asking the question, what's happening in our society? Who's the preacher in these three, these three or four verses? Who is the preacher? Who's the one giving the message? Who's the one preaching the message? No, no, not, not, not who wrote this. I think that's a good answer. But who's actually the one that's, see, that's doing the preaching? It's God. Now, God's a pretty good preacher. And God is preaching to every human under heaven. We'll see that Wednesday. Throughout all time, all space, all people, no exceptions ever, ever, ever. And not only is he the preacher, but it says they're without excuse because he's making sure they understand. I can't do that with you today. I look at your face and some of you are going, huh? But God, well, let's look, look at it, what it says here. It's the truth he's preaching. I've circled that in my notes here. He, they suppress the truth, uh, verse eight, 18, by their wickedness, since they, what may be known God, by God is plain to them. That means this truth is plain to, to them, all society. Why? Because God himself has made it plain to them. He's the preacher. He's doing a very good job. He will never fail, ever. There will never be a human being that will say, well, you didn't make that plain to me, ever. I promise, ever. As a matter of fact, we will stand before the judgment of God based upon how we respond to these things. So God has made it plain to them but since the creation of the world. And, and it goes down to the next verse and says, it's clearly seen and understood. Do you see those? I've handed this out for you. There's just a circle and underline if you want to. God's made it plain. It's plain to them. Clearly seen and understood. For God himself has made it plain to them. So God's the preacher. And he's preaching using, in this case, the things he's created in nature. Uh, and when, this week when we go into a Wednesday night, again, I'm taking this little hiatus from, from our first few words in Peter. And um, we're going to see what nature demonstrates about God. Here it says it does three things. God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, and his divine nature. So here's what I can tell you without, without any doubt whatsoever. Because God's the preacher. Don't get bored on me. This is more, more luxury. I understand. But God's the preacher and God doesn't fail. He sees to it. They understand. They're without, they're without uh, excuse because, and his wrath is being poured out because he knows they understand his divine nature. He under, we understand his, 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 his eternal eter, divinity and his invisibility and his, his creative uh, uh, eternal power. And, yep, and bring these Wednesday night, please. The most important thing I want to share right now, and then I'm going to, I'll, this is one of those sermons you can just put the caboose on wherever you want. So I'm going to attach the caboose without going too much further. Here's the question I have. There are two verses to look at them in. Verse 18 and verse 25. What do people do with this truth? Look at verse 18 and look at verse 25. What do people do? Everyone sees it, whether you're an aborigine or whether you're in the towers of New York City, whether you're in government or whether you're you know, a, a mountain man living in the middle of the woods somewhere. This is God preaching. He sees to it that it's clearly seen and understood, his divine nature. Plus, we're going to see Wednesday night way more than divine nature and his power and his deity. Way more. We're going, to, we're going to have a list of about 20 things you can see through nature that the Bible tells us. David says, I stood on the beach, basically, and I saw the waves crashing in. <laughs> and he, he talks about the power of God. So that's designed that way. God sees that the message is clean, clearly seen and understood. What do they do with this? What do these people clearly see? We're not talking about Jesus yet. We're just talking about God being the preacher to tell general populace, I'm a God and you need to listen to me and lean into me. Number, verse 18, what's the word that says they do this? They do what? They suppress it. They suppress it. It's called the truth. 
and it says the men suppress it. The men in Washington, D.C. today are people who were under the wrath of God, being turned over to ungodliness, which you'll see in these other verses, because they repress. Don't lean in, but they repress the truth. What does it say in verse 25? They exchange the truth for a lie. So we know what the truth is. It's way bigger than what I'm showing here. But these scriptures say, general revelation-wise, here's what's going on in America, not just Washington, D.C., but this is the insanity of the school system. This is the insanity of, of, of people that are trying to control your life. This is the insanity across the board of all the corporations that are lining up to be globalists. This is the, there's an insanity there. There's you know, thinking people. You can't get that high up if you're not thinking. But what's wrong with your thinking? Their foolish hearts are darkened. And you'll see that as we go into the rest of these verses. Now, some of you might be rolling your eyes at me and saying, well, he, he's kind of, in, you know, kind of intense on this. I am preaching you the truth. And I am telling you, our society is not in the best of shape. I love our, I love our, our world. I am not down on America. I will die for her and probably will, the way things are going. But I want you to understand, it got this way because there's a gradual degeneration of a society when its people are gradually degenerated. And Romans chapter 1, verse 18 on, tells us the steps of degeneration. And it starts by this, suppressing the truth and exchanging it for a lie. And as you go through this, underline every time you see that God turned them over, God turned them over, God turned them over. Each turnover that God does puts them in greater darkness and, in, and, and greater, greater uh, foolishness and greater confusion. And that is why we can say this thing is spinning out of control so fast we don't know from one day to the next how they're going to behave because they're insane. And this is the definition of insanity. You'll see it here as we read this. Okay, I'm going to stop right here because this is a different kind of morning. It's time to quit here in a little bit. And I'm going to ask, does anyone have some questions? Just a couple of questions that might help clarify something because this is a little bit piecemeal. Is there anybody that would say, boy, can I ask a question? Because we can really do this Wednesday night. Uh, Wednesday night, you'll walk out of here and understand general and special revelation wholly. And you'll appreciate it. Anybody that would just be helpful? Okay. Um, yes, sir. Uh, Dave. Amen to that. Amen. Amen. Good, good word. I want to make sure you heard it. He just said he wanted to make sure to get this out of his heart. God will use the simple and foolish things to confound the mighty. We read that verse last week we, uh, in, in Wednesday night. Um, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I don't know quite all we're going to do, but I'm on board. I'm on board the post-COVID train, post-COVID church train. And like Jim said today, there's still a lot of COVID around. Are we really post? We're post this insanity. Now we're doing things like he's doing, walking the, watch, walking the, the narrow line, trying to appeal to parents and say, I'm doing my best. We're just being as wise as we can. That was a great speech he gave there. And I appreciate that heart very much. Um, but we're, we're post enough um, to say... We're going to push back. And uh, I love what they're doing. And you guys may not appreciate this, but I, you know, I've only got another couple of weeks here. Um, is, they're, going, they're going out by the hundreds of thousands in France, in Spain, is it Spain? In Italy, in England. And they're just pushing back. The whole society is getting out in the streets and saying, we won't bow to your idols. And, and so... Okay, Kathy says, look at verse 28. Because this will be... Okay, 28 to the end says, Furthermore, since they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so that's the other thing they did with that knowledge, is truth, God gave them over to a depraved mind. You're, you're seeing a society with a depraved mind. They gave that over to do what ought not to be done. They've become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, depravity, They're full of envy and murder, strife, Deceit and malice, gossips and slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They 
They invent ways. They create concoctions. They bring out viruses, ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. It's so funny that would be in there. They are senseless, faithless, heartless, ruthless. And although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but they also approve of those who practice them. Read this thing over three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine times. We'll come in for an hour Wednesday, and we're going to talk about general revelation, special revelation, and, and uh, really get a handle on this. This is a kind of an undone sermon, but I think enough has been done to say we can close with a certain assignment. Yes? Yes. Amen. So if we keep our hearts and our minds focused upon the Lord to glorify Him for all that He does for us and to be a thankful people. Amen. Yeah. Then because they didn't do that's that's our inoculation. So yeah. we keep giving glor- uh, glory yeah, yeah, to God yeah. and keep being thankful. Yeah, that's our vaccine. Amen. The Christian's vaccine. Although they knew God, they didn't glorify Him, nor were they thankful. So uh, we were just saying, you know what? We had a good morning of being glor- glorifying God, being thankful. I would say you're all inoculated. You're not going to be a part of these, these idiots. It won't happen. I'm using strong words, but I don't know what else. I'd have to speak in Greek. Armor of God. Amen. Amen. Armor of God on every morning. And that's a very good reminder. Very good. Um, here's what I would suggest because I didn't get through very much of this. Um, I would suggest when someone's dying, when someone's dying, I uh, see that Kathy just gave me the pocket signals. You guys can all do this, all of you. Uh, let's practice it right now. You ready? I'm putting my hand in here and you go, what? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. When someone's dying, and they're not conscious. Here's how I pray over them. I don't know if it works or not, but it's based on the scripture. I say, God, I can't talk to them. I don't know if they can hear me or not hear me, but here's what I know. They have been exposed to truth. Whether they've done what verse 18 says and suppressed it, or whether they've done verse 25 and exchanged it for a lie, here they lie in this state, knowing they're near death, I ask that by the mercy of God that you would draw up from their consciousness, from their memories, that sermon they heard or that revelation they received that they suppressed. This is a merciful cry at God to you because they don't deserve it. Your wrath is what they deserve, being poured out from heaven against all unrighteousness and ungodliness of men who hold the truth in in derision. Suppress it. They don't deserve it, but you're a God of mercy. And I pray in Jesus' name that this person who I cannot talk to you can, and that you would bring them to a place of understanding the truth that they heard. I think our assignment is to pray that over living people. Based upon what they've done wrong, I would, Kathy calls governors and senators, even had me do it one day. For, I'm 69 years old. I, I called back there and I said, I want you to impeach this man. And I says, I have never, ever, ever done this call all my life. Some of you are getting mad at me because you're Democrats and you voted them in. I love you. You know, I, I think you probably have buyer's remorse by now, though. But anyhow, <laughs> and so I, I says, I, I'm asking. I've never done this. I'm 69. I've never done this before in all my life. This is the first call I've ever made in all the stuff that's going on in our society and all the crazies and everything. So please mark this down as a powerful call because it's the only one I've ever done. I'm asking you to please impeach this man from this office. Whether you agree with that or not, make your call. And they said, oh, if don't, don't, don't feel bad about making this call. People have been calling all day long. <laughs> so I can do that out of my comfort zone. But I can pray that God will deal with this insanity by dealing with the insane people who are under his curse for hiding truth, exchanging it for a lie, and suppressing it. That is where our society goes. Read through these scriptures, step by step, gradation by gradation, we're now at the point that we're at the end now. 
We're now at the end. Kathy, you can say something and then you close us in prayer. That our world has changed. We've got a full God. He's not holding back anything on us. He's, He's a full God. Mighty conqueror. And one of the things that we have not necessarily needed in the United States is the warrior aspect of God. The one who's yielding the sword and fighting against his enemies. As I was listening in devotions this week to Psalm 44, I just took a deep breath because my stomach was hit hard by what was said in there, and it was about the enemies of God. And then Psalm 2 as well, how God laughs at them in derision as the nations rage against God. And I thought, Lord, I needed that. I've read that so many times, and it's spoken to me before. But today, in the day and age that we're in, it is so relevant. It is so real, and it, and it brought into me such grace and such strengthening of my backbone it makes it to weird. be strong as a Christian and not back down in fear. You know, because everything around us is wanting us to be to afraid. Cringe. What's weird is one of the nations that's raging against him. It's always been another nation. It's now it's always, us. It's always been. Now it's us. Yeah. It's always been. But fear is insidious. It's insidious. And you have to find maybe you've never had to do this before because you've never been as fearful. I've never been. I mean, there's been times I've been afraid, but I've never had so many things where my knees feel like they're going to buckle. And there's been some things that have happened even just recently, like Thursday, Wednesday or Thursday night, I forget which night he was addressing the nation. My knees were about to buckle. They were about to buckle. And I thought, God, please help me. And these are the things that our brothers and sisters in the Lord all around the world have been going through. But they've even had worse than this. Even right now, the Christians in Afghanistan are having worse than this. And so I want to have you all stand up. We're going to close together in prayer. But if you would allow me, I would like to pray specifically for um, the right person to be elected in California. And the way it's geared, it's not geared in a right way for the right person to be elected, but we're going to pray. We're going to agree with them. Lord Jesus, we stand before you this morning as your church without spot or wrinkle because you've made us without spot or wrinkle because your blood has cleansed us. And we stand in that confidence of prayer, Lord Jesus. We stand in that confidence before your throne. And we call upon you, almighty God, as the all-powerful creator of the universe, the I am. And we're asking, almighty God, that you would make sure that we leave here today strengthened in our underbelly, strengthened in the deepest part of our beings so that we will not buckle, we will not yield to evil, but we will stand strong on the rock of Jesus Christ and put our hand to the plow without looking back and move forward to plow the fields and to do the work of your ministry, Lord Jesus, to do the work of your kingdom, that we cannot be silent, but we have to speak truth in the public marketplace. So, Lord, we ask that some of us have never done this before. We're asking that you strengthen our resolve. And, Lord, we know that you will fill our mouths like you did Paul's when he stood before rulers. He was no different from us. And so we're asking that you will fill our mouths yes. with your words and the intents and the thoughts, Lord Jesus, that you know will cut like a knife and break into the heart of people where they will be touched deeply. For California, we are praying with our brothers and sisters this week that you will break not only the uh, bondage over the churches, but that you will break the bondage over the state. Yes, Lord. 
and God, that you would give California a godly man who will lead this state and cause them, Lord Jesus, to have justice and the knowledge of God, be able to take them forward and bring their economy up and cause all of those who are in California to be set free. We pray this for your glory, Lord Jesus, and we know that you know exactly who needs to be chosen. Yes. So we're asking God that you work through all of the printing of the ballots that they're able to yes, do. Lord. Yes, Lord. And you make sure the right person gets Amen. it. For Amen. this, we give you praise and glory. And we thank you now yes. in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, wait, wait, just a second. This is like that song, This is the service that never ends. <laughs> Please bring this. Uh, Wednesday night or have it in front of your computer uh, if you're at home and I in a very troubling time of my life I had an actual real prophet come to my house and he prophesied amazingly accurately unbelievably so the next time he came I was just looking forward to hearing this real real prophet and he looked at me and he says Ed yeah, stay sweet <laughs> and so I needed that and maybe this morning I need to just say, okay, just make sure you talk how we want, but stay sweet. If you guys aren't sweet, get there. And if you are there, stay there. Amen.